I desensitize myself to it. I, 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 uh... Hey guys, my name is Rachel and welcome to the final episode in our Psychology of a Killer series, which is also my birthday, so happy birthday to me. In the first episode, we discussed the brain chemistry and anatomy of a killer and in the episodes following, we discussed their motives, how they do what they do, and discussed the heinous crimes of two serial killers in specific, Albert Fish and John Wayne Gacy. If you have not seen the previous episodes, make sure to go ahead and and check them out. Now, when we discussed the two serial killers, we talked about how they got caught, but we didn't really go into details of the behind the scene police work that actually goes into it. We hear all the time about what ultimately got the serial killer caught and the evidence brought forward in court. We can make judgments about whether we think the police even did a good job. In the John Wayne Gacy case, it seemed like the police were doing nothing. You have to assume that they were noticing the young men going missing in the same areas and being never seen again. They had all a similar description being young white men, but you have to wonder why police didn't seem to be able to connect Gacy to any of the 30 plus people he killed until Robert Peast. We discussed how some of the families actually asked police to look more into Gacy, but they didn't see any reason to. I know to us this can look really bad, but hindsight is 2020, and we know what Gacy was doing, so it's easy for us to be like, oh my god, it was so obvious what he was doing, all the warning signs were there, they should have looked into him more. But we have to realize that we don't know what kind of evidence they had at the time. We don't know leads that they were already following. We don't know any kind of investigation that they were already doing. From the outside, it looked like they were lazy and they didn't care. And maybe that's true. Maybe police just weren't doing their jobs and were being completely careless, but Maybe there's a lot more to the story that we just don't know. The reason that I'm saying this is because there's a lot more that's going on behind the scenes than we know. With that being said, for the final episode of our Psychology of a Killer series, we are going to be taking a look into the behind the scenes of how investigators catch killers. So the first step in an investigation is obviously to go to the crime scene, collect all the possible evidence and start testing it and making sense of it. However, when it comes to serial killer cases, there often isn't enough evidence left behind to immediately identify a suspect, which is why they can even go on to kill more than one person. So when it comes to the investigation of a serial killer, the first steps are basically to use all of the evidence collected from multiple crime scene, as well as collecting characteristics of the victims to create a profile of the person that they believe to be committing these crimes. This is called profiling. Now, if you've ever seen an episode of Criminal Minds, you you probably know what profiling is. But in real life, it's a lot more complicated and painstaking and a lot less spot on accurate than what we see on TV. The process of profiling was developed by the Behavioral Science Unit of the FBI in the 1970s and Ted Bundy was among one of the first serial killers to ever be profiled. The process of profiling uses many different aspects. They obviously have psychologists, and psychiatrists kind of evaluating what they think is the MO and signature of the suspect. Beyond this, they use the evidence collected from the crime scenes to determine similarities and determine the signature and MO. They will gather witness statements. They rely on their own investigative experience. They use statistical probabilities and they 
honestly use some educated guesses. One of the tools used by specialists is called the Violent Criminal Apprehension Program, which is a computerized database that collects and analyzes information on solved and unsolved homicides all across the country to determine statistic probability and make connections between certain behaviors and certain crimes. So when it comes to the nitty gritty of profiling, there are different phases of profiling that they use. First is the assimilation phase where, like I said before, they gather all the information from the crime scene, the victim, witnesses, photos, the autopsy reports, police reports, and so on. Next is the classification stage where they classify their killer as organized or disorganized. Organized killers can be a lot more difficult to catch because to others in their everyday lives, they don't look like killers. They have good social skills. They leave behind little evidence because of the extensive planning that goes into their crimes and they can be extremely manipulative. Disorganized killers, on the other hand, they lack social skills. They are more impulsive and the crime scene is a lot more messy and chaotic. After they classify the killer, they will come up with a behavioral sequence of the crime, trying to figure out the MO. They will then try to identify and analyze the killer's signature, which as we discussed in a previous episode, is the unique characteristic that they leave behind, whether they leave it behind intentionally or unintentionally to satisfy their psychological needs. Lastly, they will try to use all of this information to determine the offender's physical characteristics, their family characteristics, their education, their personality, and their psyche. They gather all of this information from the different phases to hopefully figure out where to find them, how to capture them, how to talk to them, etc. Now, these profiles can be extremely accurate and spot on, or they can be completely off. One example of a profile that was completely off was when five white women were sexually assaulted and killed in the Baton Rouge area in Louisiana. The statistical probability said that most killers choose victims of their own race, so their profile was of a middle-aged white man, when in reality, they were looking for a man named Derek Todd Lee, a black male who was middle-aged. So at the time when they were looking for someone with a different description, that kind of led them in the wrong direction. So this just shows that sometimes profiles can lead people in the wrong direction. However, an example of an incredibly accurate profile was made by James Brussel when he profiled the Mad Bomber. In short, the Mad Bomber was a man who terrorized New York City in the 1940s and 50s by planting explosives in theaters, libraries, public transport, phone booths, restrooms, offices, and many other public places. He planted a total of 33 bombs, 22 of which exploded in 15 people, but thankfully killing none. He wrote erratic letters to newspapers and was eventually caught and was put into a mental hospital after being found mentally insane. Brussel profiled the Mad Bomber to be a severely paranoid, middle-aged Catholic white man with an Eastern European background whose parents immigrated here in the 1930s and he was living with family but no spouse in Connecticut. He was said to have a medium build and would be neatly dressed in a double-breasted suit when he was arrested. This profile was pretty spot on to George Metesky. They were able to come up with this super accurate profile based on a lot of intuition and analysis. So like I said, there were ranting letters to the newspapers that came with the bombs that they could just tell were written by someone who was extremely extremely paranoid and erratic just by the content of the letters. They could tell that just by the way that he was writing these letters that his family was not native to the US and it fit the writing of an Eastern European person. He knew that people from that area of Europe were prone to using bombs as weapons and that a large number of them immigrated here in the 1930s and moved to Connecticut and those people tended to be Catholic. He knew that this man was probably too erratic to be married and probably lived with his family because that was common among immigrants. Brussel noted that this bomber was extremely finicky and precise when constructing the bombs and that he was most 
most likely very meticulous in other aspects of his life as well, which is how he knew that he would be well dressed. And then he just knew that the double breasted suit was popular at the time. Again, this was extremely accurate and he used little bits of information to come up with this profile that fit the Mad Bomber very perfectly. The analyzing and deducing that James Brussel used for the Mad Bomber is the same type of profiling that they use today. The point of telling you this example was to kind of show you how they take simple, minuscule things and turn them into characteristics that can be extremely helpful when trying to find the suspect. This is also, by the way, why us true crimers tell you that any tips, no matter how big or small, can be incredibly helpful to cases because they can use such little details and turn them into meaningful leads and connections. So in general, after completing their profile, they can look to a list of suspects that they already have compiled and figure out which suspect fits the profile the best. After this, of course, they use this to try and figure out the best way to catch them. Now, this can be extremely difficult because like we discussed in episode number one, serial killers tend to be incredibly intelligent and and methodical and make it very hard to be caught. A lot of times investigators would not be able to find these killers without them slipping up and making a mistake. A lot of serial killers will go on for so long that they start getting more comfortable and therefore more sloppy. If you watched any of the Ted Bundy tapes, which I'm sure most of you have, there was a part where they said that they actually needed him to kill more victims before they'll be able to figure out who's doing this. Obviously, they don't want more people to have to die, but it gets to a point where there just isn't enough to go off of unless they start making mistakes. For example, the main reason why Albert Fish was caught was because he wrote that letter to Grace's mother, which was traced back to him. A very sloppy move on his part, and if he never wrote that taunting letter, he may have never been caught. With John Wayne Gacy, we saw how many people he was able to kill over two years before he got sloppy and went for a boy who had a family that reported him missing right away after being seen with him at the store that he worked for. Again, if he hadn't been so careless as to taking a boy that he had been publicly seen with, who knows if or when he would have been caught. As for the mad bomber, he was caught using past work files that had very similar writing to the letters that he was writing to the newspapers. Again, if he hadn't been writing all of these erratic letters, who knows if and when he would have been caught. So a lot of times when there's a serial killer that is just impossible to find, detectives may rely on them slipping up and getting careless, which if you look into almost all of the prolific serial killers, most of them are caught because of their sloppiness after not being caught for an extended period of time. Now, when it comes to catching people who commit crimes, profiling is not the main technique used and it likely isn't even used for a lot of the cases that involve only one murder. However, profiling can be a very useful tool when there's a lot of suspects or when there's no suspects. Basically, the profile can help investigators come across a possible suspect and then the physical and circumstantial evidence can help pin them down. Now I want to get into some other type of evidence that can be used to convict a killer. One of the new types of evidence is digital forensics. Now obviously in the cases that we discussed, John Wayne Gacy and Albert Fish, Digital forensics were not used because we weren't as technologically advanced as we are today. But today, digital forensics can be a useful tool into finding killers before they even have the chance to reoffend. I think one of the biggest reasons that most of the prolific serial killers that we hear about are from 20 plus years ago is simply because we didn't have the technology that we have today and as we know, a lot of serial killer cases and cold killer cases are being solved because of the new technology. One example is the Golden State Killer. Like I said, a lot of the serial killers that were caught were caught because they made mistakes and got sloppy. The Golden State Killer was never caught out of sloppiness or carelessness, but 
he was caught because of the forensic technology that we have today, which is absolutely amazing. So anyways, digital forensics is basically recovering and analyzing data found in digital devices like your computer or your phone. From this, investigators can gather direct evidence for a crime, from text messages that may include someone talking to someone about the crime to photos or videos or posts on social media. Cell phone pings and other location data can be used to prove or disprove an alibi or to find out where someone was while certain things were occurring. Or beyond that, let's say someone posted to social media. Let's say a potential victim posted to social media or texted someone something like, I'm running away. Investigators can use digital forensics to find out exactly where this message was sent from, which can be helpful in determining if that person even sent the message or posted that themselves, or if it was a ruse set up to mislead detectives. Again, we can think to cases where people posted to social media things that made investigators believe that they may have run away, but using digital forensics, they can find out exactly when and where this was posted, and a lot of times, it was posted by someone else in a different location. Digital forensics is incredibly complicated and can be extremely difficult for investigators to even obtain. It can be a privacy issue and there's a lot of pros and cons when it comes to detectives being able to obtain this information, but it can be extremely helpful in locating possible victims finding evidence and confirming stories. Again, it can be a huge resource in preventing killers from even having the chance to reoffend. Of course, another type of evidence that we know of is DNA evidence, which is another amazing tool that investigators can use to connect someone to a crime. With advancing technology, scientists can use even the tiniest amount of DNA to connect it to a suspect to a crime or even the suspect's family tree. Every person's DNA has a unique code, but people in the same family trees have very similar sequences, even though they are unique. Of course, the closer the person is to your family, the more similar the DNA will be. So obviously your sister or your brother might have a very similar sequence than you, whereas your grandparent will have a similar sequence to you, but it won't be as similar as your brother or sister, if that makes sense. But anyways, scientists have even learned how to use this DNA to create a possible picture of what the person might look like, which is absolutely insane. So for example, if your family member was to commit a crime and they had this person's DNA, but their DNA wasn't in the national database, but for some reason yours was, they can connect your DNA to the suspect's DNA and figure out that they, let's say for example, have the same last name as you and they can tell that they are in your family tree. This is how they can pin down a specific person by using family DNA because again, let's say your grandparents' DNA was in the system, they connected it to you and then they tested that and they're like, can I test this person? Can I test this person? And they can test it until they find an exact match. Or like I said, they can paint a picture of what this person might look like. Let's say they use this DNA to figure out that someone has pale skin, dark hair, and blue eyes. They can use this profile and list of suspects to connect the person to the DNA. This is a very complicated process and it used to be something that took a very long time, but with technology advancing, it's getting a lot easier and a lot quicker. Or of course, something that would be a lot less complicated is if a killer's DNA is already in the national database system, then they can easily just use DNA connected from a crime to connect it directly to the person. But if they can't do that, then they have the other ways of doing it, which they didn't have before. Next, I want to touch on circumstantial and physical evidence. Circumstantial evidence is evidence that relies on an inference to connect to a certain conclusion. For example, a security camera seeing a car that looks just like yours driving to the crime scene around the time that it happened can be used as circumstantial evidence to make the conclusion that you may have been at the crime. While a lot of people see circumstantial evidence as not enough, it can be extremely helpful when there is maybe less physical evidence than you would like. Yes, circumstantial evidence by itself probably won't earn a conviction because again, it can only be used to make an inference and an inference does make room for reasonable doubt. But when there is other physical evidence, circumstantial evidence can support said evidence even further. Also, circumstantial 
circumstantial evidence can paint even a better picture for a jury on how and when a certain crime was committed. Physical evidence can be extremely confusing and some things may count as physical evidence while some don't. For example, you might think that a fingerprint at a crime scene is considered physical evidence and can be enough to pin someone down for a crime, but it might be circumstantial evidence because just because the fingerprint was there doesn't mean that they committed the crime, but they were at the crime scene at some point. However, let's say that there was a fingerprint in blood of the victim or something like that, that can be used as physical evidence. Witness testimony can be physical evidence if they put you at the crime scene as it was taking place. Let's say that they saw you shoot someone, or it can be circumstantial if maybe they said they thought they saw you, or if they saw you walking past the residence a few hours earlier, or if they just saw you walking into their home, something like that. Basically, it's all about how the evidence was found and how it's presented. Either way, no matter the type of evidence, it has to be compelling enough for there to be absolutely no doubt that they committed these crimes or murders before or they can even be convicted. When it comes to serial killers, a lot of times when they are actually caught, there's a plethora of evidence that makes it very obvious that it was them, especially since there's so many different crime scenes, therefore so many different things connecting them to the crime. It might be hard for investigators to catch them in the first place, but once they do, a lot of times they can make very obvious connections. With Albert Fish, he was tracked down and basically just confessed to everything. He told them where Grace's remains were and investigators found them. As we know with John Wayne Gacy, they found about 30 bodies on his properties, so it's pretty hard to say that you just didn't know how all these bodies got there. Plus, like we discussed in episode two, Fame and recognition for their crimes plays a secondary role in a lot of killers' motives. After being caught, they want the world to know what they did. So a lot of times they will confess to everything that they did and even brag about it. Basically, there is so much evidence that investigators can use to connect suspects to the crime and we have basically just scratched the surface. DNA evidence and digital forensics are up and coming technological advances that I think will be making a massive impact in the criminal justice world in the coming years, which is why I wanted to focus on those things in specific. Obviously, we know that investigators rely on witness testimony, fingerprints, hairs, fiber, surveillance, and so many other things to pin the suspects down. Basically, just to summarize, detectives will collect evidence from the crime scenes and come up with possible suspects that could be connected to the crime. But these suspect lists can be extremely long with tens or maybe even over a hundred names on them. Investigators can use a criminal profile to come up with the type of person that they believe to have committed these crimes, enough to come up with an idea of who they should be focusing in on on their suspect list or even who they should be talking to that's not on their suspect list. Then after narrowing it down to exactly who they think it is, they can use DNA, digital forensics, or other circumstantial or physical evidence to get these criminals behind bars. In a lot of the older cases, we see that these vicious killers are put to death. John Wayne Gacy, Albert Fish, Ted Bundy were all sentenced to death. Others were put to jail for the rest of their lives and just died while in prison. Some were killed by other inmates while they were serving their sentences. Some took their own lives while they were in prison and others were found mentally insane and were sent to live in mental institutions, Ed Gein being an example of this. In a perfect world, all serial killers and violent criminals in general are caught and sentenced to prison to live out the rest of their lives thinking about what they did and suffering the consequences. However, we know that we don't live in a perfect world and not all killers are caught. Not all profiles are correct. Not all killers leave behind any usable evidence and not all detectives, investigators, and police are dedicated, honest, and justice seeking. There are killers who slip through the cracks, police who botch investigations, and victims who never get justice. And that is just the clear cut, brutally honest truth. However, with the constant advances in technology, I have faith that so many cold cases will be solved, so many ongoing investigations will be solved, and so many future crimes will be solved quickly and easily. After doing all of this research and sitting down for literal hours every day for a few weeks, I just wanted to end this series by saying that 
we all need to keep an eye out for each other. It was extremely interesting to look into the mind of a killer and figure out just how they think, but at the end of the day, what really matters is the victims. Anytime that we talk about Ted Bundy or John Wayne Gacy or any other of the brutal attackers out there, we need to remember their victims. People who suffered the greatest tragedies. Serial killers are not people to be glorified or romanticized. They're not people that we should look into because we like them or we think they're cool. We should look into them so we can learn how to keep ourselves safe and how to stop them. If you like serial killers because you think they're cool or you picture yourselves dating them or you think that they're attractive or whatever, you are looking into them for all the wrong reasons. There's nothing wrong with being curious like all of us are, but there is something wrong with finding joy in the pain that their victims suffered. We need to respect the victims in all of these cases and keep their memories alive. For anyone watching this, I hope that you find this information interesting, but I hope that you can also use it to keep yourselves and your loved ones safe. If you're like me and you're choosing to put yourself out there online, whether it be on YouTube, YouTube, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, whatever. Never put out your personal information no matter what. Do not post where you live. Don't post where you are. I would go even as far as saying as don't tell people what school you go to. If you are on YouTube or if you have a large following on any social media sites, don't post your or your family's whereabouts. Don't tell anyone where your children or your other family members go to school. Don't have your location on on Snapchat. Don't tell people your exact location. If you're on vacation, you can tell people where you're going, but don't tell them the exact hotel you're going to, for example. All of this might sound extreme and to some unreasonable measures, but especially if you have a large following, do not tell people anything about yourself or your family. I know another YouTuber personally. I know his first, middle, and last name, and I know the town he lives in, and that is all that I knew about him. When I looked him up, first, middle, and last name, and using the town that he lived in, I was able to find his phone number, which I already had, so I wasn't being creepy or anything like that, but I was able to confirm that it was the real phone number, but I was also able to find his current address, all of his previous addresses, his family members, and all of their information, all of that. I told him that I was able to find all this information and I asked him if it was correct because I don't know him like personally in real life, but I know him, you know, by talking to him and texting him and I don't know his actual address. So I asked him if this information was correct and it was. I'm not going to mention the website that I used or anything like that, but I want you to know that this information is out there, so you need to be extremely careful with what you are willing to share with people and who you are willing to share with. As for everyone else, even those who don't put themselves out there or don't have a large following, make sure that you are aware of your surroundings at all times. I'm not saying that you have to walk around paranoid or constantly looking over your shoulder, but if you're somewhere that you're unfamiliar with or if you're out late at night, make sure that you know your surroundings, pay attention to your surroundings, and always try to make sure that you at least know someone or that you're with someone. If you are alone, it never hurts to share your location with a friend or family member, if nothing else, for peace of mind. I don't know if Androids have this feature, but I know that iPhones have the feature where you can send your exact location to someone, so I would definitely recommend doing that. People might think this is controversial, but I would say make sure not to put yourself into a situation where you're under the influence of drugs or alcohol if you are by yourself or if you're in an unfamiliar situation or with unfamiliar people. Girls, if you are at a party with a bunch of guys that you don't 100% trust, please be careful. Yes, like I said in my other video, it's up to others not to hurt you. It's up to us to teach our children not to hurt others. But there are people who just do not care, so I urge you, Whoever you are, wherever you live, whatever you're doing, avoid situations that you are not 100% comfortable in. If you're alone at night, especially if you are a girl, whether you're in your car or you're walking to or from a store or even into your home or whatever, make sure that you look confident and aware. Don't be looking down on your phone. Don't look scared. Don't look completely oblivious to your surroundings. 
don't give anyone else the idea that they can take advantage of you. I'm going to be linking down below a great video of someone who is discussing how to use body language to keep yourself safe. I don't know this YouTuber, anything like that. I've never talked to them in my life, but I think his video is extremely helpful. I do plan on making an entire video on how to keep yourself safe, but for now, these are just a few things that I'm rambling on about to hopefully make a difference. So that is where I'm going to end the video. I know I kind of went off on a little bit of a tangent at the end, but I think it's so important to keep ourselves safe and keep an eye out for one another. But anyways, if you liked this video and our psychology of a killer series, Series, please make sure to give this video a thumbs up and check out the playlist of the rest of the videos in the series if you did miss any of the videos. Make sure to subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to follow my Twitter and Instagram. Both will be linked in the description box below. With that, I hope you guys have a great rest of your week and I hope to see you in my next video. Bye!